So we are going to talk about Euler's identity. For real numbers x, we know that e to the x equals the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus x over n to the power of n. You can check the link in the description for an explanation of this. The question I have in this video is if we define e to the i theta using this limit, would Euler's identity still be true? Would we still get e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta? To figure that out, we're going to start with some polar coordinates. Remember if we're just looking at an ordinary 2D plane, a 2D graph in our x and y axis. Any point we have, any pair of numbers, x comma y, we can write as r cosine theta comma r sine theta. In this case, r is the distance from the origin to this point, x comma y. And theta is the angle that this point makes off of the x-axis. Now what I'm going to do is translate this idea into complex numbers. If we're now looking at the complex plane with our real and imaginary axis, a point here, instead of x comma y, we're going to write as a plus bi. Now using this exact same polar coordinates formula over in the complex plane, we can write this as r cosine theta plus r times i sine theta, or r sine theta i. So these are the same polar coordinates that we saw in the xy case. Now I want to rewrite this a little bit more. First of all, this magnitude r, that's the distance of this point from the origin, using the Pythagorean theorem, we can write that as the square root of a squared plus b squared. Now if we factor out an r from this whole expression, what we're left with is cosine theta plus i sine theta. What I'm going to do is define a new function cis, or cis theta. This is short for cosine i sine, and cis theta is defined as just equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta. So this gives us our polar form for any complex number. Now I want to ask what happens if we take cis a times cis b? We can expand this out using the definition. So cis a is cosine a plus i sine a, and cis b is cosine b plus i sine b. Now we just need to FOIL this out. So first of all, from these first two terms, we're going to get cosine a cosine b. Now from the last two terms, we have an i times i, which is negative 1. So we're going to get minus sine a sine b. Then if we take the first and last term, we're going to get one factor of i, so plus i cosine a sine b. And then if we take the inside terms, we're again going to get one factor of i, and then sine a cosine b. Now this first expression, cosine a cosine b minus sine a sine b, that's the angle sum formula for cosine. So this equals the cosine of a plus b. And this part over here, we can factor out an i, and cosine a sine b plus sine a cosine b, that's the angle sum formula for sine. So we get sine of a plus b. And by the definition of cis, this is the same thing as cis of a plus b. So we get cis a times cis b equals cis a plus b. One way we can think about that for our limit is instead of multiplying just twice, we want to ask, what if we raise a number to a power? What if we take cis a and raise it to the power of n, like we're going to do in this limit? This is the same thing as multiplying cis a by itself n times. And every time we multiply these two, we're going to add the angles in here. So if we multiply cis a by itself n times, we're going to add the angle to itself n times, which means the resulting angle is n times a. So this equation here gives us a formula for raising cis a to any power that we want. Now let's use these results that we have and return to our limit. We want to look at 
Euler's identity. So we're asking what is the value of e to the i theta? And we're going to say, let's suppose that equals the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus i theta over n to the power of n. In order to find this limit, we're first going to express this in here using our polar form right here. And then we're going to take the limit of that polar form. So let's ask, what is the polar form of 1 plus i theta over n? First of all, we need the magnitude. That's super easy to get. We just have to take the square root of the real part squared. That's 1 squared, which is 1. And then the imaginary part is theta over n. So we're going to add theta squared over n squared. Now we need cis theta, which means we need to figure out theta. Remember that if we go back to our polar form here, theta is the angle of the complex number off of the real axis, this direction. So what is the angle of 1 plus i theta over n? Let's make a graph. If we go over here, we have our real axis, imaginary axis. And right here we have the point 1 plus i theta over n. And let's go ahead and draw a right triangle here so we can try to find the angle. We have our right angle here, and this angle I'll call it alpha. This is what we're looking for. Now, this horizontal length of the triangle is along the real axis. So this side length is the real part of 1 plus i theta over n. And that's just equal to 1. The vertical part going in the imaginary direction, that's the imaginary part, which is theta over n. So that's this vertical side length. Now our goal is to find the angle alpha. Let's use some trigonometry. If we take the tangent of alpha, the result we get is opposite over adjacent. That means theta over n divided by 1, which is just theta over n. So if we take the inverse tangent on both sides, we get alpha equals the inverse tangent of theta over n. And this works for any values for, of this angle between pi over 2 and negative pi over 2 in this first or fourth quadrant. And because the real part of our complex number 1 plus i theta over n is positive, we know this inverse tangent is going to give us the right answer. So we can go back to our polar form over here and plug in cis of the angle we want, which is inverse tangent of theta over n. Now we need to figure out what's 1 plus i theta over n raised to the power of n. So if we take this complex number and raise it to the power of n, that means we need to raise both of these things to the power of n. Now the square root is the same thing as the 1 half power. So if we raise the 1 half power to the power of n, we multiply those powers together, the exponent is n over 2. And then finally over here, we want to take cis of this angle to the power of n. But we have a formula for that that we found earlier. The cis of some angle to the power of n is just cis of n times that angle. So we're going to get cis of n times the inverse tangent of theta over n. So this right here is the expression that we're going to plug in to our limit to find e to the i theta. Now all that's left is to find the limit of this expression. Now in order to find the limit of this part times that part, I'm going to find the limit of the first thing and then the limit of the second thing and we'll multiply those together. Because if both of these have limits that exist, then we can multiply those two limits separately and we'll still get the right answer. So let's start with this first part. Now in order to find this limit, I'm going to switch the whole number n to some real number x. That's going to make our job easier. So I'll take the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 plus theta squared over x squared to the power of x over 2. Now the reason I'm switching n to a real number x is that we can take the derivative with respect to x, but we can't do that with whole numbers. So let's call this limit L. What makes this limit hard to deal with is that we have an x up here in the power. And that's kind of hard to deal with when x is going to infinity. So what we want to do is bring this power back down to the front. 
And the way we do that is with natural logs. So I'm going to take the natural log of this limit L. And the cool thing about limits is that we can switch the natural log of the limit that's equal to the limit of the natural log. So I'm going to bring the natural log to the inside. We get the limit as x goes to infinity of the natural log of 1 plus theta squared over x squared to the x over 2. And then the cool thing about natural logs is the natural log of something to a power means we can bring the exponent down to the front. So I can have an x over 2 in the front just like that, and we can get rid of the exponent. Now this limit is still a little difficult to deal with. So if we look at this limit and take x going to infinity, this x over 2 part, infinity over 2, that's just infinity, but this part in here we have natural log of 1 plus theta squared over infinity squared. So that's going to be 0 in here, 1 over infinity squared, and then we'll have the natural log of 1, which is just 0. So this limit is an infinity times 0 situation. That's kind of annoying, but we have something called L'Hopital's rule that lets us deal with infinity over infinity, or 0 over 0. We don't really know what to do with infinity times 0, but we can take this expression and turn it into a 0 over 0 form, and then we can use L'Hopital's rule. So what I'm going to do is take this x over 2 and move it to the denominator. I'll take this 1 half, that's a constant, so we can pull it outside the limit. And then we have the limit as x goes to infinity of natural log 1 plus theta squared over x squared. And then we have a factor of x, which I'm going to write as 1 over 1 over x. And now the top goes to 0 as x goes to infinity, and the bottom also goes to 0. So we can use L'Hopital's rule. So let's use L'Hopital's rule on this expression right here. That means we take the derivative with respect to x of the top and the bottom. So let's look at the top first. We have our limit as x goes to infinity. Now the derivative of natural log gives us 1 over the inside. So we're going to get 1 over 1 plus theta squared over x squared. And then we have to use the chain rule, take the derivative of the inside function. So the derivative of theta squared over x squared, that's the same thing as theta squared x to the negative 2 power. So if we take the derivative with respect to x, this part's a constant, and we're going to use the power rule here. This becomes negative 2 x to the negative 3, which is the same thing as negative 2 over x cubed. So this is the final answer for our derivative. So we go over here, multiply by negative 2 theta squared over x cubed. And then again, we have to take the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of 1 over x is just minus 1 over x squared. So let's see what we have now as a result. We have a 1 over x cubed up here in the numerator. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and take that to the denominator. So we still have our minus 2 theta squared, but we had a divided by x cubed. I'm going to bring that down here. And then notice, x cubed divided by x squared. What does that give us? Well, that just gives us x. So on the bottom here, we're going to have minus x. And now we can take the limit as x goes to infinity. Because 1 over 1 plus theta squared over infinity squared, this part is just 1. So we have this whole thing going to 1, and then on the bottom we have minus infinity. 1 over infinity is equal to 0. So that is our final answer for the limit. We have natural log of L equals 0. So we take e to the power of both sides, which means e to the natural log of L, that's L, and e to the 0 is 1. So the limit of this first expression here is just equal to 1. And all we have left is this second expression. So now we have this limit over here. I've written that down. And again, I've switched that whole number n for a real number x so that we can take derivatives. 
Now remember I said earlier the limit of a natural log is the same as the natural log of the limit. We can switch those around. I'm going to do the same thing here. The limit of cis of this expression is the same thing as cis of the limit. So this is cis of the limit as x goes to infinity of x tangent inverse theta over x. So let's forget about the cis part for now and just figure out the limit that we're looking at in here. If we plug in x going to infinity, we're going to get infinity times the tangent inverse of theta over infinity. This part is zero and the inverse tangent of zero is also zero. So this is another infinity times zero situation. We should probably try L'Hopital's rule. So just like we did before, let's take that x down to the denominator. So we have a 1 over x, and now this is 0 over 0. We use L'Hopital's rule. That gives us the limit as x goes to infinity. Let's think about the derivative in here. First of all, the derivative of the inverse tangent, that's going to be 1 over 1 plus this thing squared. So theta squared over x squared. Kind of funny that this was the same thing we had with the natural log earlier. And now we use the chain rule, take the derivative of this function, the derivative of theta over x with respect to x, that's going to be minus theta over x squared. And then in the denominator, the derivative of 1 over x is minus 1 over x squared. So this divided by x squared and divided by x squared are going to cancel. The minus and minus are going to cancel, so it becomes positive. And that leaves us with the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over 1 plus theta squared over x squared times this value theta. Now theta is just a constant. If we take the limit as x goes to infinity, this part is dividing by infinity squared. That's going to go to 0. And we're left with 1 over 1 plus 0. This part is just 1. So the final limit is just theta. Now remember, this whole thing was cis of the limit. So this part in the inside is going to evaluate to theta. That was the limit we just did. But this entire expression, of course, is going to be cis theta. So the limit of 1 plus i theta over n to the power of n is equal to 1 times cis theta. And if we go back to our definition of cis theta, we get the final result e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. So if we define e to the i theta using this formula for e to the x, Euler's identity is still going to be true.